In the previous video, we discussed how an index event caused an increase in the sympathetic nervous system activity and the RAS activity, leading to an increase in ionotropy, chronotropy, preload and afterload. We discussed the effects of increased preload and we discussed how when preload is increased in a pathological manner for a prolonged period of time, it results in a hemodynamic overload, which we called volume overload. The volume overload led to volume overload hypertrophy in which there was a serial addition of sarcomeres leading to the dilation of the left ventricle with an increase in the radius. And we explained how on the basis of the law of Laplace, this led to a progressive decline in the pumping capacity of the heart. And when the pumping capacity of the heart declines, the residual amount of blood that is present in the ventricle at the end of diastole goes up which leads to an increase in preload and in this way the vicious cycle continues. If we recall the scenario number two in our previous video, um, we will remember that the SNS and the RAS remain activated for months or possibly years throughout the lifetime of the patient who has survived the myocardial infarction. Now this would mean that there would be a prolonged and sustained stimulation of the beta adrenergic receptors, the AT1 receptors and the mineralocorticoid receptors. An understanding is required on what happens upon prolonged and sustained stimulation of the beta adrenergic receptors and the AT1 receptors in the cardiac myocyte and in the cardiac fibroblast. An understanding is also required on what happens on the prolonged and sustained stimulation of mineralocorticoid receptors in both cardiac and extracardiac cells. Now why do we need to know this? Knowing this helps us to understand how subsequent events unfold following an index event that inflicted the initial damage to the heart. Now. Let us try to understand what are the effects of prolonged and sustained stimulation of beta adrenergic receptors and AT1 receptors on the cardiac myocytes. So here's a cardiac myocyte with its nucleus and DNA and the surrounding cytoplasm. That is the capillary which is supplying this cardiac myocyte with its blood supply. Here we see the beta adrenergic receptor, there's the AT1 receptor. And on prolonged and sustained stimulation of these receptors, one of the first effects that occurs would be hypertrophy of this cardiac myocyte. So, hemodynamic overload in the form of volume overload did result in hypertrophy, but it is important to understand that beta receptors and AT1 receptors upon prolonged and sustained stimulation contribute, contribute massively to the hypertrophy of the cardiac myocyte. So here is that same cardiac myocyte which has undergone significant hypertrophy. Note that the capillary supply has not increased. This massive cell requires a lot more oxygen and blood supply. It does not get it. Alright, so here is the nucleus and DNA with the cytoplasm surrounding the cell. Here's the beta adrenergic receptor and there's the AT1 receptor. We said that upon prolonged and sustained stimulation it results in hypertrophy of the cell which has already occurred. Also, upon prolonged and sustained stimulation, it leads to a phenomenon called metabolic or transcriptional reprogramming of the cell. What does that mean? It's not something very, very complicated. Almost all cells contain nuclei and the nuclei contains DNA, which of course has genes. So whenever these genes are activated, they undergo transcription and translation and various proteins are formed, which carry out the functions of that particular cell. Now, in a cardiac myocyte, when there is prolonged and sustained stimulation of the beta adrenergic receptors and the AT1 receptors, the genes in the DNA do get stimulated. But upon transcription and translation, they produce altered proteins, which carry out functions which are suboptimal. Let's see what we mean by this. Here is the hypertrophied cardiac myocyte, and upon prolonged and sustained stimulation of beta adrenergic receptors and AT1 receptors, transcriptional reprogramming has occurred which resulted in the formation of uh, suboptimal or altered voltage sensitive sodium channels, potassium channels, some calcium channels over here. Then 
altered sodium calcium exchange and now this is a very important protein when we start talking about a drug called digoxin third calcium regulating proteins we know that calcium is the most important protein which is responsible in the contraction of the heart the proteins which are responsible for regulating this ion get altered also we have contractile proteins here in the sarcomere of the cardiac myocyte contractile proteins include actin over here and myosin over here now even though the number of sarcomeres do increase in hypertrophy the sarcomeres will be consisting of a form of myosin which is of much lower strength and much lower effic efficiency when compared to myosin in the non hypertrophied heart therefore in spite of a larger number of contractile proteins and a bigger size of the cell the si the cell is weaker and less contractile than a non hypertrophied cell so this is what we mean by a pathological hypertrophy right also prolonged and sustained stimulation of the beta adrenergic receptor and the at1 receptor causes the cell to become more prone to apoptosis okay now next we need to understand the effects of prolonged and sustained stimulation of beta adrenergic receptors and at1 receptors in the cardiac fibroblast but before that let us try to understand the role of the normal fibroblast in the healthy heart so here's a normal fibroblast and let us see what it does in the normal heart in the normal heart the healthy fibroblast is concerned with the synthesis of components of the extracellular matrix and the degradation of the components of the extracellular matrix now the most important components of extracellular matrix include uh, collagen and fibronectin now normally these two processes exist in a finely balanced manner and this is normal it occurs in healthy hearts the process is called uh, physiological remodeling or adaptive remodeling an entirely normal process when this fibroblast uh, gets stimulated or rather when the beta adrenergic receptors and at1 receptors on this fibroblast get stimulated in a prolonged and sustained manner this balance is lost and what happens is there is an excessive synthesis of extracellular matrix excessive deposition of collagen and other extracellular matrix components in the tissue is by definition fibrosis fibrosis in cardiac tissue is associated with devastating effects the heart um, in with the, the stiffness myocardial stiffness increases the contractility of the heart decreases the perfusion of the heart decreases and this heart becomes extremely prone to developing arrhythmias now let us now try to understand the effect of prolonged and sustained stimulation of beta adrenergic receptors or rather mineralocorticoid receptors in various cardiac and extra cardiac cells okay so we do understand that mineralocorticoid receptors are present in the epithelial cells that line the collecting duct of the kidney and upon stimulation it causes increased reabsorption of sodium and water thereby increasing the preload we know this we should also understand that mineralocorticoid receptors are also present in various cardiac cells including cardiac myocytes fibroblasts vascular endothelial cells uh, vascular smooth muscle cells and so on we should also understand that mineralocorticoid receptors are also present in various extra cardiac cells notably extra cardiac macrophages now when mineralocorticoid receptors at these sites are stimulated in a prolonged and sustained manner they also contribute greatly to the fibrosis of the heart okay so as a result of prolonged and sustained stimulation of beta adrenergic receptors and at1 receptors on the cardiac myocytes and also due to hemodynamic uh, overloading there occurs cardiac myocyte hypertrophy the cardiac myocyte hypertrophy occurs without a proportional proportionate increase in the vascular blood supply and therefore there is a reduction or a fall in the capillary myocyte ratio this kicks off a process of metabolic reprogramming within the cardiac myocytes which results in altered ion channels 
uh, contractile proteins, calcium regulating proteins and an increased risk for developing uh, apoptosis. Also, when there is prolonged and sustained stimulation of beta adrenergic receptors and AT1 receptors in cardiac fibroblasts, there is an increased risk of fibrosis. And this will increase the myocardial stiffness. It will uh, decrease the cardiac perfusion, increase the risk of arrhythmias and so on. Also, when there is excessive uh, stimulation of mineralocorticoid receptors on cardiac and extracardiac cells including extracardiac macrophages this also uh, contributes to fibrosis so all these changes together are what we refer to as pathological remodeling pathological remodeling occurs over a period of months or even years and has absolutely devastating effects on the failing heart now this heart is already pumping faster, harder, against more resistance and it's pumping a higher volume. And as the heart struggles to do all this extra work, it slowly undergoes changes whereby its ion channels get altered, its calcium regulating proteins get altered, its contractile proteins get severely altered, its individual cells get prone to apoptosis and it undergoes more and more fibrosis by which it becomes more stiff, less perfused, more prone for arrhythmias and so on. Now, how do all these changes alter the function of the heart as a pump? Now let's try to spend some time on this diagram over here and I'll walk you through it. This is the left ventricle which pumps oxygenated blood into the arterial system. It supplies oxygen to the peripheral tissues and once it unloads the oxygen over there, it becomes poor in oxygen and it enters the venous system over here. The veins carry the poorly oxygenated blood to the right atrium, which sends it to the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps this blood into the pulmonary arteries where it gets oxygenated in the lungs and the oxygenated blood is carried by the pulmonary veins back to the left atrium which pumps it into the left ventricle and the cycle continues. Now you can see that this is a patient who has suffered a myocardial infarction but survived and the compensatory mechanisms like positive chronotropy, ionotropy, uh, increase in total peripheral resistance as you can see here and an increase in preload due to increased aldosterone caused increased reabsorption of sodium and water from the collecting duct, the black thing over here. Okay, so all the compensatory mechanisms are intact. Now, as the months and years go by, the process of pathological remodeling becomes more and more until the heart is severely diseased now. The, pro the pumping capacity of this heart is severely impacted until at some point in time, back pressure is exerted on the heart and this back pressure continues to get reflected on the pulmonary veins until at a point in time this pressure is reflected onto the lungs. This will cause an extravasation of fluid into the interstitial space in the lungs and very gradually this can lead to condition of pulmonary edema. Okay, now the same thing occurs in the right ventricle so when there is a back pressure that is exerted on the right ventricle and the right atrium, this pressure gets transmitted to the venous system and ultimately causes extravasation of fluid in the interstitial spaces in the periphery and causes peripheral edema. Right. So when there is a progressive left ventricular dysfunction, it leads to progressive increase in pulmonary venous pressure, causes progressive extravasation of fluid into the interstitial space and alveoli, and causes a progressive fall in the pulmonary compliance and causes breathing difficulty. It may come as a surprise to the beginner, but the hallmark symptom of chronic heart failure is a respiratory symptom. It is dyspnea. And dyspnea, uh, is defined as a subjective experience of breathing difficulty or discomfort. Right. So, soon after the index event, the patient recovers. Well, at least in our example, the patient recovered and is more or less asymptomatic 
because the compensatory mechanisms fully compensate for the damage that has occurred. But as the process of remodeling progresses, the patient begins to develop symptoms. Initially, the patient suffers only from exertional dyspnea, which is often missed. But as the remodeling process produces more and more damage, the patient starts developing very characteristic uh, patterns of dyspnea, one of which is orthopnea. So orthopnea more or less means uh, that the patient starts developing uh, dyspnea in the recumbent position. And this dyspnea may be relieved by uh, giving the patient a few number of pillows and elevating the head end, basically putting pillows um, at the head end of the patient. So making the patient propped up or sit up or even stand. Now, as the remodeling process produces even more damage, a very particular form of dyspnea develops, which is called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. So this may be defined as <clears throat> sudden awakening of the patient in the middle of the night, usually maybe after a couple of uh, hours of sleep. Uh, the patient wakes up with severe anxiety, severe breathlessness, and the patient may bolt upright in bed and run to an open window and gasp for breath. It's a very dramatic situation and the patient may be so afraid and apprehensive that the patient may not go back to bed again for fear of another attack of paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Later on, the damage produced by the remodeling process may become so severe that the patient becomes dyspneic even at rest. So as we go from this particular point in the scale downwards, we see that the process of decompensation becomes more and more until a point is reached when the patient cannot compensate for the damage anymore and the patient develops frank acute pulmonary edema and this is the cardinal feature of acute decompensated heart failure. This is nothing short of a medical emergency and if not treated immediately we may lose this patient. Right. Okay, so, so to summarize, an index event occurred like an MI which caused an increase in sympathetic nervous system activity and the RAS which caused increased chronotropy, inotropy, afterload and preload. This caused a prolonged and sustained stimulation of the beta adrenergic receptors, AT1 receptors and the mineralocorticoid receptors resulting in a pathologically remodeled heart with progressively lower contractility. The patient gradually becomes more and more symptomatic until ultimately compensatory mechanisms fail. So this would be uh, a summary of what we discussed in the previous video and this would be the summary of what we discussed in this particular video. I think we are now ready to discuss about the drugs used in heart failure.